Executing polyrhythms in piano playing can be a very challenging task, particularly if we are dealing with more complex ones such as 3 against 4 or 3 against 5. In today's episode, we will use mathematical, visual, oral, and kinesthetic, so to do with muscles, ways to explain how to execute polyrhythms, in this case 3 against 5, but as you will see, the same can be applied to any polyrhythms out there. Pianists tend to use two distinct ways to learn how to play polyrhythms. Some use intuition and try to align main beats of the polyrhythms together with the metronome, while others try to understand how mentally and visually those polyrhythms work. Let's start with math and the visual way of discussing polyrhythms. So to explain the mathematical division of any polyrhythms really, we do a simple math and do a little drawing to make sure that we understand what it is about. So let's say if we have rhythm of 3 against 2. Let's say we have triplets in one hand and then duplets in the other hand. So how do we know where those notes coincide? We basically multiply 3 times 2, we end up with 6, and we draw little 6 notes, sorry, 6 dots, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Now let's say this will be our right hand, so above the line and left hand just below. If our right hand had triplets, every note of the triplet will be every two notes, every two of those dots. So one, one empty, one empty, one empty. So this is our triplet. Now our duplet will be every three of those dots. One, two, three. One, two, three. So from this drawing we can tell that the second note of the duplet comes exactly in between second and third note of the right hand. Let's go ahead now and do the same thing with 3 against 4. So let's say in the right hand we have 4 semiquavers and in the left hand triplets. So again we multiply them together, we end up with 12. We draw 12 of those dots, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. And our right hand will be above our left hand will be below. So in the right hand we have semiquavers, which means we draw a semiquaver every three of those notes. Two, three, two, three, two, three, one, two, three. So these are our semiquavers. Our triplets will be every four of those little dots. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. So now we know that the third note of the semiquaver, this one here, comes exactly in between the two, as in rhythm of two against three, because four is just a twice faster rhythm than two. And the other two, this one is relatively close to the second note, being before it, and this one relatively soon after the third triplet note. And finally, we'll go on to 3 against 5. So let's say that we have 5 notes. Oh, sorry, that's 6. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 notes in the left hand. And let's make them uh, semiquavers. And in the right hand, we'll have triplets, quavers. So we'll try to figure out how this should work. So again, 3 times 5, we have 15 of the dots, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, so we have 15 dots, and the right hand will be above, left hand below, so we'll try, the left hand, quintuplets, should happen every 3 of the dots, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, one, two, three. One, two, three, one, two, three. We have five notes. That's our five. 
Now our triplet will be once every five notes. Five dots. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. I would say that the easiest way to think about this one is that the second triplet comes just before the third note of the quintuplet and the third triplet comes just after the fourth note of the quintuplet. So this is basically a visual representation of how those rhythms come about, how do we know where they fit, and we can even take the music that we are using, let's say here is an arabesque by Debussy, and the polyrhythm happens here in this bar. We have duplets in the left hand and triplets in the right hand. So we can now draw that the first note of the group is exactly together, while the second note should fit exactly in between the two. Another one, this one is together, and the second one fits just exactly between the two of the notes in here, and so on. So if we have trouble, we can use drawing on the music to figure out what is the visual representation of this. We'll do the same thing for the Chopin's Emperor tune. So here maybe we start with a full group. So this is together. Then this note, the third note of the semiquaver, as we can see in here, is exactly between second and third note. So this comes right in between the two. This one is slightly before, this one is slightly after, and so on. And finally, to the probably most advanced example, 5 against 3. So in here, the second of the quaver comes just before the third note of the quintuplet. So this note will come just slightly before this one. And in this bar we are missing the third quaver, and this being a semiquaver will be after, so this is quite straightforward. Let's say here is a full bar where we can experience that. This is together. Now, as we saw in here, the second triplet is just before number three, so just before this, and the third quaver triplet is just after this one. So this is basically the visual representation of polyrhythms. To get a good listening representation of those rhythms, if you would like to be able to do it at home, most of the metronome apps have this ability to actually present the rhythm in polyrhythms. Let's say I choose here a polyrhythm, 3 against 4. 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3. Now something worth pointing out is that since I chose the 3 on the left side and 4 on the right side, I can hear the 3, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3 as the main rhythm. And if we change it back to 4 against 3, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4. This helps us follow and hear the rhythm of 4. So depending on the use case and if you find this difficult to follow 4 or difficult to follow 3, you can change the way you hear it and get used to this. I suggest that you use this way of practice. So basically opening up an app and listening to it number of times a day until your ears get used to how the particular rhythm in question sounds. That tends to be very helpful in later on executing those rhythms on the piano and clapping them and counting them aloud. Finally, we get to the point where we try to turn all this mathematical, visual and listening knowledge into a practical component. So in this case, into clapping. I think the easiest way for me to show this is going to be on the rhythm of, let's say, two against three. So if you try to do this, first you need to learn how to clap this rhythm without playing anything. So one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two. Three. For a rhythm of two against three, you can use, for example, one cup of tea, one cup of tea, or simply count one, two, and three, one, two, and three, one, two, and three, or one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Yes, so we learn to clap this. We should be doing this quite often throughout the day because rhythm is not something that we can accommodate, let's say, in a single one hour practice session. It's much better to spread this out across, let's say, number of days and many practice sessions during each day. 
So let's say we've accomplished this and we can do it with ease. Two, three, one, two, and three, one, two, and three. Now we can start shifting this to our piano playing. So let's say we can still keep clapping the left hand and play single notes with the right hand. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two. Then we switch the rhythm to the left hand being triplets and right hand duplets. One, two. Yes, and we do it with other hand as well. Or Finally, we play both hands at the keyboard, so. Now the next step is going to be create a horizontal movement, so let's say a scale or an arpeggio, while maintaining this rhythm. So we can do it this way. Now just to give you some examples from the repertoire on how this can be actually used, let's have a look into the arabesque by Debussy, one of the more popular ones, so this section. So we have rhythm of three against two. So in order to do this correctly, or to use this way of practice, we can clap the left hand. Or do the other way around, so practice the right hand with triplets and play the left hand. Yes, and this can be done for any piece of music. The second method, of practicing polyrhythms does not take really under the account an understanding of how those polyrhythms work, but uses more a physical approach to synchronizing the hands when they need to be synchronized. Now this method needs to be used at at least a medium tempo, otherwise it's going to be difficult to align all the notes in the right timing. So before you attempt this method, I would say you need to know the notes quite well. Let's say in the case of the Chopin's impromptu, we'll set the metronome on 19 and we try to play first the right hand while maintaining very clear understanding of where the main beats are. So, let's say like this. And then we do the same thing for the left hand. Once we feel comfortable doing this, I suggest to students to keep interchanging between the rhythms of four and three, one after another, immediately, like this. Yes. Then we can do it even with single beats. And finally, we try to put this together, not thinking about any subdivisions in between, but simply aligning the main beats. So. Yes, this can work, and I would say roughly 50% of students will feel comfortable with this, but those who do not, they should probably try to learn how to do this in this more mathematical and better understanding way. Once the current tempo is accommodated and feels comfortable, start moving gradually faster until you reach the tempo you want to play the piece at. Now this video was requested by someone from my viewers who asked about the WC piece that he's currently working or was currently working at that stage, which has the rhythm of five against three with some additional complexities of those rhythms. Now with a piece like this, which is already of high artistic value, the viewer had trouble with executing this in a faster tempo. Without seeing the pianists playing this music, I would say that one of the more common reasons why this section could be difficult is because the movements themselves, the physical manifestations of those rhythms, are not choreographed properly. So let's see what we can do to fix that. I would suggest practicing this in full bar, so starting at the beginning of the bar and stopping at the beginning of next bar, creating a nice smooth movement, in this case of the left hand. And the same thing in the right hand, so that it's not a vertical plane, but more 
Tini are so And we do it again. And then left hand again. And then we try to join it together with one swap of emotion. And the same next bar. So by synchronizing the movements, so there is no rigidity in between them, that there is no stiffness and no thinking about vertical motions, but more horizontal circling ones, that helps us align the music, align the rhythms with how we play it, and then make it out more comfortable to perform it in a faster tempo. As a final note to this video, I wanted to mention that the physical freedom and the physical choreography of the movements while executing complex rhythms like this is of really serious importance here. Quite often, the problem with polyrhythms is not related to students not understanding how to do them, not understanding the math behind them, not knowing how they sound, but quite often it's some form of stiffness in their hands. So if, for example, we try to execute this rhythm but my, our left hand is stiff, it will behave slightly differently than the right hand and because of that we will realize that actually physically it's very difficult to execute those rhythms. So let's say in a case of something like this, please make sure that your hands are free and create some form of circles with the elbow and wrist. and the same in the right hand. So there is no stiffness, so when you put them together, things feel easy, things feel comfortable and flexible. I hope this helps. Thanks. Bye.